On today's episode of Sound Iron Sessions, we're going to be writing a modern rock style track using the new David Oliver's drum kit, so stick around. Hello again everybody, this is Craig Peters here from Sound Iron, and welcome back to another Sound Iron Session where we write tracks in various styles and break them down, and then we'll talk about some of the mixing and mastering and just overall creative approach and just to hopefully give you some tools and ideas that you can use for your own music. So in today's video we're going to be breaking down a track that I wrote in kind of a modern rock style, something you'd hear in like car commercials or even reality TV shows like Rust Valley Restores or Car Masters, Rest to Riches and you know similar shows in that kind of vein. So this was a fun one for me because I got to bust out the guitar again. For this track I'm going to be showing you a little bit of my approach as far as how I built it and just my process along the way and we'll talk about some of the mixing and that sort of thing as well. So let's go ahead and check out the track and then start breaking it down. All right, so that's the track. Now let's go ahead and start breaking it down a little bit. So when I first started writing this track, I wanted to get some different drum grooves that I can base some riffs on. I knew sort of the feel and the vibe that I wanted, just real kind of laid back rock feel. And uh, what I did was I took some different drum grooves from Superior Drummer and just kind of built out the overall structure of the song. I wanted to have kind of like an intro to build up the uh, you know the vibe a little bit, sort of just mainly just having the drums, a little bit of guitars, just kind of playing some like percussive mutes and that sort of thing. And then after that, I didn't really have any bass yet, but I did end up writing some bass into this part. But let's just go ahead and check out sort of the first little portion of it. Just drums. And the bass right here is pretty much foreshadowing what ends up being the, the kind of the main riff uh, with this structure. It's pretty much like a intro, sort of like a the chorus. Not I mean, normally it's like intro, verse, chorus, that sort of thing. But for this, I was kind of thinking, well, if this was maybe like a theme for a TV show or a commercial or something like that, you know, try to get to the point, let it build up as if, you know, there was like a lead way and then just have it kind of come in with the big riff. And this is sort of like, I guess I would call it the chorus. So I have the bass pretty much, you know, leading in to what will be like the full big riff. So, which ends up coming here. So 
So you got a little build up right here. So, and I just wanted something to kind of build in because uh, some of these parts weren't with the drum grooves that, uh, that I pulled in. So the way I approached it is I used the drum grooves to kind of basically like lay out the structure but I modified them as I started writing the riff. So I didn't just keep everything exactly as is. So I knew for this part, okay, let it lead in with the bass. Eventually the bass and the guitars are all gonna come together. But I was like, what if I had this little like kind of tom part just to kind of build in into that. The guitars just kind of slide down into it and you can hear that right here. Let's go ahead and solo the guitars. So you can see it's very bluesy. It's got a lot of those kind of, you know, passing tones and like blues scales and that sort of thing. And the guitar that I use in this track is my Ormsby Hype GTI. And this is a seven string guitar, but I didn't use my seven string because that would just be a little too heavy. So pretty much I was thinking, okay, I want it to be rock, heavy, have a little bit of that swing to it. So I was kind of... That was kind of the first sort of riff that I was swinging on. I wanted a doom, boom, ding, do, 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 do. Almost kind of like a, you know, like a bluesy riff, but a little bit harder, a little bit more kind of like, a little bit more heavier rock, I guess. So this pretty much ended up being the main riff. So after that big main riff plays a few times, the next thing I wanted to do was have a little bit of a drum break and then build into a fun guitar solo. And the riff changes a little bit, it modifies. I wanted to kind of keep the same feel, but change the chord progression around a little bit to make it a little bit more fun to solo over. So you have this little drum break and then just kind of cranks into the, some leads. So let's check that out. For the plugins that I use on these guitars, I used the Neural DSP John Petrucci plugin, and this is a really awesome plugin. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this one. And I was wanting to, you know, play around with some different amp sims that I haven't really used too much. Uh, the main thing I used while tracking was the Kemper, but then I'm just mainly using that just to hear it as I'm tracking so I have no latency, but then when it plays back, it's playing through the plugin. So I'm gonna go ahead and just solo the guitars so you can hear how this sounds. I'm gonna mute the guitar solo just so you can hear the rhythms. So you can hear it's just like a real thick kind of nasty saturated guitar tone. I didn't want it to be too heavy or too clean, just something a little a little nasty, you know, something to just give it a, a nice thick sound in the mix. And then if I go ahead and bypass these, you can hear it's just the DI. So I always track straight into my Countryman Type 85, and then I have a cable running into my Kemper so I can hear with the Kemper at the same time, and then be tracking DIs at the same time as well. So that's really useful. Whenever you can record DIs, it's so much better and it just makes it to where, you know, if you want to audition different amp sims or reamp it later on with something like a Kemper or just throw on some different plugins, it's definitely a good thing to do because having the DI gives you way more tonal control later on after the fact if you ever want to change your tone. And then if we go ahead and turn these back on. And then for my guitars, I always hard pan them left and right because I want the widest sound possible. And then for the guitar solo, I'm also using the same Neural DSP Petrucci. Uh, the only difference is I use some different effects on here. Yeah, I have some reverb just to give it a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of that nice shimmery reverb sound. So this is without. Also, I have some chorus on here as well. Yeah. 
<laughs> now, a really cool thing about this plugin is that it also has a wah on here. And what I did was I went in after the fact and wrote in some, some different automation just to utilize this wah. And I just kind of moved it around and wrote in the automation as I was listening to it, sort of where I would use a wah pedal if I was playing this lead uh, with the wah at the same time. So if you watch right here, you can see the wah pedal actually moving as it's playing. <laughs> So it definitely helped with kind of giving it that bluesy vibe. Um, I'm a big Metallica fan and Kurt Hammett used to always use a wah pedal a lot of times when he was doing like pentatonic style leads. So I thought that would be a nice fun addition to this lead. And the next thing I want to talk about is my approach for the bass guitar. I used my Kiesel five string bass for this. And the way I approached it was by splitting the bass. And this is a term you've probably heard if you're familiar with, you know, doing like more like hard rock or metal or extreme metal type mixing where they'll split the bass into a low and high sort of thing. So this is just the recorded bass by itself. And what I did is I just recorded it uh, with the DI. And then I'm using this Parallax plugin from Neural DSP as well. Uh, Neural DSP makes great plugins for amp simulators. So I generally reach for these when I'm not recording either with a real amp or with the Kemper. So if we turn this on. So you see it's got that nasty sort of high end uh, bark to it. It's got a lot of grit on the top end. And if you can notice, it sounds a little thin. And the reason for that is because what I ended up doing is I split the bass. So I'm generally trying to do like a crossover between what's like the low end of the bass and like the more uh, upper range of the bass. And that's mainly where like the tone and the, that real bass sound is coming from. And then for the low end aspect of the bass, I'm using Sub Destroyer from JST. And this is where I first started hearing about the splitting of the bass type approach. And if you've ever seen any of the like nail the mixes or different types of um, mixers out there uh, using sort of like a, a sine wave or like a sub for layering underneath the bass. And this is mainly just for sometimes when stuff's not recorded properly or you just want a really tight low end and you want all the low end to be perfect. Generally, you'll use some kind of like sine wave or sub, you know, sub sine wave or something just to kind of really have that nice solid low end and then utilize the real recorded bass on top just for that, that real bass tone. So if I go ahead and solo this, So it doesn't sound too much like anything really by itself. And then if you look at the EQ, I have pretty much this. This is the only thing that I want. I'm just filtering out pretty much. This is where all the real bass is. And I, this is mainly just holding down that low end. And then if I go to the real bass, and then if I show you my EQ, you can see it's kind of that crossover. So this is where all that low end is coming from. And then this is all the real bass. And then also for the, the sine wave aspect, I also used uh, FabFilter Pro MB. And this is just to keep any of those super low end uh, notes from poking through too, too much. I don't want it to have a lot of spikes. I want to kind of keep stuff pinned as much as possible and have the low end is, you know, as tight as I could. So that's how I approach the bass. So when you hear them together, I take out the uh, sub destroyer. Then in the context of the mix. And then after that, I just routed all these to a group and then here just kind of playing around with the volume and where it's seeing where I want it to sit in the mix. And then also for the rhythm guitars, uh, another cool thing that I did just to help give the guitars a little bit of width, I wanted to try to make the guitars a little bit wider. 
I used this S1 imager from Waves, and this is a really cool trick. It's very easy to go too heavy handed on this because it's like, man, I want to make the guitars wide, but you can go a little too far if you, uh, if you get too crazy and bringing up the slider a little too high. But I just wanted to pull it up just a little bit just to give the guitars a little bit more width and give it that nice wide sound. So if I solo the guitars and then turn this off, let's hear how it sounds. So you can see it just gives it that little bit of extra width just to help kind of spread it out and give it that nice wide guitar sound, which I'm a big fan of. All right, so now let's go ahead and start talking about the drums, which was the whole reason for why I wrote this track. It's a demo for David Oliver's drum kit. And David Oliver, who you know we've collaborated with in the past for libraries like Rhythmic Odyssey and Shake, and David Oliver just owns a lot of drums. And it's been really awesome collaborating with him because we've just been getting able to sample his collection. And it's really awesome to have because he's got a lot. And this demo was utilizing the David Oliver drum kit, which we recorded a Pearl DLX drum kit. It's a drum kit he's owned for 30 years, so it's got a lot of history and, you know, it just really captures that old school classic drum sound, you know, like if, for, if you're doing any kind of like funk or rock or anything like that, it just really has a lot of character to it as far as the way it sounds. and you know, definitely suits well for stuff like rock and, you know, blues and that sort of thing as well. So let's go ahead and start checking it out. And one of the really cool things about this library, if you're one of those people that like to take all the instruments and route them on separate tracks and use your own plugins for mixing, you can do that. So if you go into this mixer page down here, you'll see that for each group, I have it routed to different outputs. So I have output one, output two, output three, and this all corresponds over here. So if I ever want to just solo the kick, add a little snare, a little bit of room, or just route them all to a drum group. So I also have some drum verb on here as well, and this is utilizing the uh, Valhalla Room. So if I turn this off, this is how the drums sound. Nice, you know, slightly live sounds, nothing, nothing too reverberant. So I wanted to use this reverb not to give it that big arena rock kind of sound, but just like a nice, big, large live room. And the preset that I used on this was this snare big room, and I just modified the settings a little bit and played around with it to where I found settings that I liked. And then since this is an effects track, I went and I took each of these uh, different channels right here for the kick, the snare, the toms. I used the sends, and then I sent them all to this reverb and just played with the send amounts just to till I got the, you know, the sound that I wanted. Some have a little bit more than others, or as far as like how much it's sent into the reverb, like the snares got a little bit more, and then the toms have a nice little bit amount as well. But everything is pretty much feeding into this, but some are a little more than others. All right, so now let's go ahead and start talking a little bit about the mixing for the drums and how I approached it. All right, so what better way to start than talking about the kick drum? So, I got this EQ on the kick, and this is pretty much just doing general kick moves that I normally do. I was trying to get a little bit more of like, not a metal sounding kick, but a little bit more of like a little bit of a deeper kind of punchier hard rock style kick. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off all these plugins, and then let's just go ahead and, well actually I'm gonna, let's just turn them all off and listen to the kick drum by itself. Turn on the EQ. 
So you can see it kind of takes out some of those more low mid and mid areas of the kick and kind of scoops them out. And what I wanted to do was boost that sort of fundamental frequency that I want for my kick, generally around 60 hertz. Usually what I like to do is I like to have the kick below the bass. So what that means is I like to have the kick around 60 hertz as kind of like that main sort of uh, sub focus or that main kind of like low end focus for this and then usually the bass I'll have around 80 so I'll high pass my bass around 80 or so well for this one I uh, high passed it a little bit more because I was doing the crossover point so I have this boost right here and then I'm just kind of boosting this top part and this is really where the uh, the click of the kick uh, lives so let's just go ahead and I'm gonna turn this off so you can see it kind of gives it a little bit more of that kind of like attack where you, where the you know beater hits the skin and I really like that sound and when you go ahead and, and turn these off you can you can really hear a difference so you can see it just kind of cleans it up and gives it a nice a nice sort of clean sort of like smiley EQ effect and then after that I'm using JSD clip just to kind of give it a really nice sort of you know clipped kick sound keep everything really even and just kind of give it a little bit of juice so this is how it sounds with and then and I really like using this plugin on drums it works really good and then after that I got some smash and grab from get good drums and this is a really cool compressor and it's got a couple different modes it's got a smash and grab and you know one's for a little bit more harder style compression and another one is just you know so like a general sort of compressor and it's got some really cool settings I have it set to kick which is nice you know so you can utilize the different drum types depending on what drum type you have you have it on and then uh, just kind of played around with the settings a little bit, you know, giving it a little beef and a little bit of air. And, you know, it's a, it's a really cool plugin, super easy to use, and I like to experiment with it every now and again. So let's hear it without. So I really like it with this compressor. It really gives it a nice little oomph to it, and I think it sounds really cool. And then after that, I got some virtual mix rack on here. I'm using this virtual channel, and this is from Slate. And I'm just using this to give it a little bit of that kind of, you know, console vibe. And then I have this trimmer on here as just if I ever need to, you know, trim the gain. Sometimes I do it within the pre-gain of Cubase. Sometimes I just have this. This is just a preset that I use as a general starting point. So if I ever need to, you know, give it a little bit more headroom or just kind of, you know, get my gain staging right, I'll usually just use this here. So it really depends on, uh, you know, you can do gain staging from anywhere. So... I just like to have this as kind of a little bit of a means of gain staging. And then for each drum group, I'm utilizing the same virtual mix rack and virtual tape machine just to give it that nice kind of uh, simulated analog warmth and just uh, gives it, especially for this track, it gives it like that nice kind of warm sound. So if I turn these off, So I really like that. I like how that sounds. And one of the things that you have to be aware of is that this plugin, the virtual tape machine, will induce some some extra low end. So if you don't want that, you can go into the settings right here and go to this bass align, and you can remove some of that if you're getting a little bit too much low end when using this plugin. So sometimes you can get things sounding a little hyped and get all you know stoked on it, but then you know. Maybe you don't want that extra low end. Maybe you want to have a little bit more control over that within the EQ. So just something to be aware of. Now let's go ahead and check out the snare. So for the snare, I'm using FabFilter Pro Q3 as well. And just doing some filtering. I don't need all this down here for the snare. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off the key. Let's go ahead and turn all these off. So this is the snare by itself. No processing. Turn on the EQ. So right here, you see this little fundamental frequency of the snare, and generally, it depends on the snare, but you'll see this kind of spike right here. And that's kind of the body and like the meat of the snare. And I like to boost that a little bit with EQ, just giving it a little soft bell. And I could probably even dial this back a little bit more if I wanted just to. So it just kind of accentuates that frequency. And I like to do that, especially on snares, as well as toms and kicks. 
So I have this little dip right here, and this is just kind of cleaning up some of that kind of like upper mid area. Nothing too much. And then right here, I got this high shelf, and this is just kind of boosting a little bit of that top end of the snare and giving the snare a little bit more of that air quality. So if you turn this off, so you can see it kind of gives a little bit of life and kind of brings in some of that air in the snare. And I like to do this kind of technique as well, especially on like strings or those type of instruments where you just want to boost a little bit of that air in the, in the instrument. And then after that, I'm using FabFilter Pro C and let's go ahead and hear how this sounds. And then this is just for, you know, compressing the snare. And then I also have some JST clip on here. Like I said, I like using this on drums and works really well. So without, and then with, just helps give that extra little bit of, of life to the snare and making it pop a little bit more in the mix. And then after that, we have the virtual mix rack and the virtual tape machine. And then for the toms, since they're both routed together within contact, I have them routed out together. So this is pretty much acting as my tom group. So it's got both toms in there. And this is a little bit of the EQing that I did. So with this, I'm just filtering out some of that low end that I don't need. And I'm accentuating some of those frequencies that really resonate with the toms. So if we go ahead and listen to it without. And then with. So you can automatically hear that clarity in the toms and usually it's, I usually approach this kind of similar to the kick, just kind of filtering out some of those kind of like lower mid and upper mid frequencies where you hear a lot of these kind of resonating qualities. So if I turn these off, has a little bit of that kind of, a little bit of that boxy kind of papery sound. So you can see it starts to kind of clear out that area and really let you hear the toms for what they are. And they were recorded great and they're really great sounding toms. And this is just kind of helping them shine a little bit more. And then right here, you can see I'm boosting this fundamental frequency right here. So just kind of accentuating the, the body of these toms. And then I got this boost up here, similar to the kick and this is just kind of accentuating that stick attack on the toms to really help kind of boost it and cut it through the mix. So I really like how that sounds. And then after that, JST clip once again. And this is just to, like I said, help make it cut through and give it a nice clip sound. And this just really helps with just getting it to cut through a dense mix, especially when you got a lot of bass and heavy guitars and solos and all that stuff. You definitely want to do these kinds of moves with the, with the EQ of the, of the drums just to really help them sort of cut through all of that. Because uh, guitars start to take up a lot of room, so doing these kinds of things help. And then we got the virtual mix rack and virtual tape. And then for the hi-hat, I'm just doing some filtering, just kind of taking out some of those frequencies that I don't need. I don't need these symbols to be super bright. So I just wanted to take out some of those frequencies just to help it kind of sit back a little bit more in the mix. Filtering out all this right here. So I'm just pretty much filtering out stuff that I don't need just to help it sit in the mix a little bit better. And for this track, there's not really a lot of ride happening. It's mainly like crashes and hi-hats, but I did do a little bit of filtering on here, just kind of scooping out all the stuff that I don't need and also just making it sit a little bit more in the mix by taking out some of these frequencies right here. And then I'm also using L1 just for really maintaining those transients and not letting things poke out too much because symbols can definitely get a little overruling if you don't treat them. So I'm just doing this as a way of just kind of taming that. Now let's go ahead and move on to the crash symbols. 
And with this, I'm just filtering out a bunch of stuff that I don't need. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn these off. Let's hear the crashes by themselves with no processing. So you can see I'm just filtering out a lot because since I have the crashes and then I also have crashes coming through the overheads in the rooms, I wanted to not have it be too overbearing. So I wanted to filter out some of the actual crash groups themselves and then blend that in more with the overheads in the room. So if we go ahead and turn on uh, the L1 and this is just kind of doing the same thing that I did with the ride and just kind of uh, taming it a bit more. And then let's go ahead and turn on the virtual mix rack and virtual tape. Now let's bring in some of those overheads. So this is the overhead. So when I turn this EQ off, And then we got the room right here. And then in context. And then for the overheads, I have some filtering going on as well. I'm just kind of scooping out some of this. So if we solo the overheads, So you can see it's not really a huge difference when I, you know, turn this on and turn it off, but it's just taking out stuff that I don't need, which is nice because, you know, you want to try to free up as much frequency space as possible for everything else. So doing these types of moves helps. And I've heard some people say they have theories on, you know, is high passing everything a good or bad thing? I don't know. But I mean, this is general sort of mixing 101 that I've seen and, you know, seems to help, you know, free up some of those different frequencies. And then right here, I'm doing a bunch of scooping out. So just kind of freeing up a little bit of space right here in this area for other instruments. And then I'm just doing a little bit of dip right here just to darken the cymbals a little bit more. And then I'm also using Decapitator on here as well. I'm using this Drum Fattener 1 preset and this is just giving it a little bit of uh, a little bit of grit so if I turn this off turn it on kind of gives it a little bit more life kind of brightens it up a little bit and gives it a little bit of grit sometimes adding a little bit of grit and distortion to some instruments can really help them cut through the mix and Pretty much with the overheads in the rooms and the different symbols, I'm pretty much just trying to kind of filter out what I want to have them all sort of live together and gel together in their own space. And then for the room track, I'm also doing a little bit of filtering and you can see it's a little bit different than how the overheads were mixed. And I'm pretty much just kind of approaching these a little bit differently. And as I'm doing this, usually I'll have like the overhead, you know, not muted. So that way, because if you're just, EQing each thing solo, you could be going a little too heavy handed. So it is nice to kind of um, hear it in solo, maybe hear some frequencies that maybe you might be missing in the context of hearing it with other instruments. But then after that, unmuting the other track and then hearing how they sound together and then making some final changes from there. So here's the overhead and the room together. kind of boosting a little bit more up here. I kind of took this away from the overheads, but then I'm boosting a little bit in the rooms and then just filtering out some of these different frequencies that I don't need. So if I listen to just the room. You see it clears it up just a smidge, but just enough to let it to where I'm not taking away anything, but just taking away the things that I don't need. And that's always an important thing. And then we got a little bit of L1 on here just to kind of tame some of these frequencies once again. Kind of has a little bit of that pumpy vibe, but that's okay.
So we're almost done. Now we're going to check out our drum group. So what I have on here is this plugin BG Drums, and this is also from JST. Uh, this is a cool plugin I wanted to experiment with, just you know, doing some drum bus compression. And let's go ahead and turn everything off and listen to this without it. So just giving it a little bit of drum bus compression. And then I'm using JST Clip on here, once again, just as another layer of uh, clipping the drums, just to kind of give them the, that nice clipped sound. And then we got our virtual mix rack and tape. Now let's listen to it all together. Now let's bring in our drum reverb effects track. So if we go in here and just turn off all these plugins, let's go ahead and listen to how the drums sound. So you can see by A-being the processing for these drums, all I'm really doing is trying to enhance the sound of them. They have a nice warm vintage quality to them. They're recorded great and I love the stereo pair of TLM 103s. Really gives it a more full range sound and a lot more to work with when it comes to shaping the sound in the mix. So it was a lot of fun to mix these drums and uh, hope you guys learned something from this video and uh, get a little bit more insight into putting together a modern rock style track. All right, so that about wraps up this episode of Sound Iron Sessions. If you like these types of videos and you want to see more, make sure to subscribe to the Sound Iron YouTube channel as well as give this video a thumbs up and hit the notification bell to stay up to date on when future videos like these drop as well as future walkthroughs for new products and many others. So until next time, I want to say thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.